I welcome any questions. Um, and unfortunately, in this kind of setup, it's difficult to do them as we go along. But if you have anything as we're going along, why don't you put them in the uh, chat box? And if, if uh, we have any time at the end, um, you know, we can maybe address some of those. But also, you're more than welcome to email me. And my email is shown here. Also, my phone number. It's a California number because I was living in Fresno for a few years. Um, but um, I'm very hard of hearing. And so I really prefer an email. Uh, that's probably my first choice. The second would be a text message, right? Um, so let's try to get started. And I think, you know, the, what we can try to do with nutrition is to try to make plants grow maybe in climates and soils that they don't normally thrive in. And it is rare fruit growers. I think that's one of your real big problems. But everything that I'm going to talk about is not just for rare fruits. It's about all sorts of crops. So let's get into it. Why don't you go to the next. Okay, here, here's what I really set up is my first objectives, right? I wanted to talk about what are organics. And I wanted to talk about nitrogen. This is probably one of the most in, misunderstood areas of organics and mineralized fertilizer, right? Also, we want to talk a little bit about the difference between organic, for the, if you're registered as organic with the NOP, the National Organic Program, and how that is different from what a scientist considers to be the chemical definition of organic. One of the things that I have found all over the world is people don't understand what I call the major cation hierarchy of solubility. And that's mainly potassium, magnesium, and calcium. Um, then we're going to get into the mobility of nutrients, how the plant also decides where it's going to send its energy. And I'll talk quite a bit about what I call the handicap of calcium and boron. And then we'll talk about stress and what stress does to hormones and how hormones affect stress. And these are all things that happen for both organic and, inorga and uh, conventional systems. Okay, next. You know, but in some of my conversation with John, uh, ahead of time, I had a little bit about, about the science and the research. And so I added a little bit more. And I think one of the problems that I have found that a lot of people have all over the world in a lot of different countries is they tend to think that what they learned about plant nutrition is the final word. But the fact is, we're always learning more. And I just put a few examples here of how zinc wasn't considered essential until 1926 and nickel was in 1975. And we're, I'm gonna talk a lot about how plants use the different forms of nitrogen. Okay, go to the next. I talk with a lot of scientists and, and agronomists, and this is one of the concepts that they have, the law of the minimum. Now, this was done in, you know, 150 years ago, and uh, we've come a long way since then. And 
so we need to realize that while this was an important first step, it's nowhere close to where we are today. Next. Now, the stress is probably the, what I call the new frontier of agronomic research, because that's about nutrients, hormones, the DNA, the internal signaling uh, uh, systems that exist, be in the, exist inside the plant. And we're gonna be, keep learning more and more about this. And you're going to find, if you look into this, there's things you can research on the internet. And don't be surprised when you find conflicting ideas, because that's the way it is when, when people start learning. And even when we know a lot, there will still be a lot of conflicting ideas. Um, but this is something that we want to keep our eyes open all the time. Next. So let's talk about stress because that is what plants suffer from. And all things, temperature, moisture, physical damage, salinity, uh, excess or in insufficiency of nutrients, diseases, uh, insects, all of these things cause stress. And the stress involves changes in hormones and how the plant tries to adapt. But there's one thing that I have found, and from all the research I've done, is that they, all forms of stress do have one thing in common. And that is that they produce ethylene. And ethylene is a hormone it's very important. It's a hormone of ripening. It's a hormone of senescence. It goes up and down, even within a leaf, uh, during different periods when the plant is growing. But ethylene, when there's too much stress, ethylene becomes a problem. And you can go in to the effects of fruit drop, uh, senescence, um, all sorts of things that are le leading towards the demise of the plant. Next. Okay, I, th I thought I should probably mention also GMO because, you know, we can hardly pick up anything in the supermarket without seeing that it's non-GMO or GMO. But I think there's some lessons that we can learn from GNO, GMO research. And this is some work that's done on corn. And if you just, you can read it, you can look at it further, but look how you have an ex, uh, a very strong root system in one picture. And with that stronger root system, you had less abortion of kernels. And that's something, let's go to the next, that when we look at how scientists actually think about uh, genetic engineering, we see that what they're doing is they're looking for well, they're doing what we should do when we watch our crops. First, we need to observe things. And we know that salt, and we're talking mainly about sodium there, and drought, uh, speeds up the senescence of plants. We know that the stress changes the sink and the sorts relationships. And I'll talk about that more in a minute, but I'll just very quickly mention, basically, a source is where a plant has some nutrients that it wants to move to another area, and that other area is the sink. 
And then there was another very important uh, um, observation, and that is cytokines, which is another hormone, that they delay senescence. And so we'll talk a little bit about cytokines. It's, it's, it's very important. So what they do, they look at that, they make a hypothesis, and then they try to get a, another plant that has stronger resistant and, and put in those genes, right? Next. Well, I think as I look at the research on what they're doing with genetically modifying things, let's go, go back to the, the next one. There, there, this one, yeah, okay. I like to think what, what a, GMO slips off your tongue. It really is easy to say. I came up with something that's not quite so easy, S-E-G-P. And what I mean by that is saving and enhancing genetic potential. Because every plant that I am familiar with has some degree of, to make to, to resist different types of stress. And when we modify inputs, we can actually enhance that plant's ability. So rather than just looking for GMO or looking for another variety that may have a little more resistance, sometimes we, because when you go from one variety to, to another, a lot of times you lose some of the benefits you're after as far as yield or quality because you're making some sacrifices there to get more stress resistant. And I think we have the ability or the opportunity to find some nutritional uh, inputs that will help enhance whatever potential the plant has. Next. Now let's, I think you all know all of this stuff, but just, just in case, you know, just we want to review quickly because we'll talk about these in more detail. The plant basically takes nutrients up from the soil via the xylem tissue, right? We can also apply nutrients foliarly to the leaves and to the woody tissue and it may move in the xylem or it may move in the phloem or it may not, right? The production of energy, which is photosynthesis, takes place in the leaves, but those leaves also are storage of, and also in the woody tissue, the plant stores nutrients that it can try to move when it needs it. And and so the plant is, if it takes the energy that's in the leaves, let's just take that for the time being, the plant has some options on where it's gonna send that energy. It can send it to the roots, it can send it to new shoots, or it can send it to reprodu reproductive growth. And that's where, Hormones begin to play a big problem, a big, uh, uh, a, a big important um, issue. Next. Okay, this kind of just sums up what I said um, a second ago, right? And the, the energy that is typically produced in the leaves are known as amines or NH2 nitrogen or amino acids, right? And so it's going to be the hormones that are influenced by stress that tell the plant how to use that energy. So go ahead. Next. Now, plants need all of these hormones, but there are three that I want to talk about 
I've already mentioned ethylene, and I very quickly mentioned cytokines, and I've highlighted what is important about these. I have not talked about auxins. And if there's a problem that I probably see more often than any other problem, or one of the most common, is the plant has too much auxin hormones. Auxins produce apical growth dominance. And in doing so, it, and, and they're, they're produced mainly with nitrate nitrogen, we'll get into that in a minute, but when plants have long internode lengths or long branches, what they end up doing, if they're short of any nutrients, those nutrients are insufficient in that new growth. And so the new growth may not be as productive as we would like, to, like it to be. Go to the next. Okay, now let's go back to those first subjects. Let's talk about organics. Now, it's, it, organic is such a, an umbrella term. It can mean anything from compost or mulch to animal or plant proteins. And like I mentioned before, it's one thing to a scientist and another to the NOP. Uh, to a scientist, it has carbon. The rules of the NOP go way beyond just having carbon. They include even the non-organic minerals, how they have to be produced, right? And some of it, to me, from an agronomic point of view, doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but they're trying to really cover all their bases and so the people have confidence when they have the NOP sticker that they're not using any pesticides or, or any uh, non-allowed uh, uh, products. Now, organic matter is very important because, and I'm sure all of you know that, it improves soil quality and water retention, and it tends to have a lot of trace elements. But most people that I talk to believe that organic materials are a slow release form of nitrogen. And this is kind of an incomplete understanding of nitrogen, and we're going to get into that also in a minute. Now, certified organic fertilizers are expensive. There's no doubt about it. But I think there are ways that other growers can take advantage of organic proteins without having to buy the certified. If, if, if you are certified with NOP, you got to follow all those rules. But if you just want to improve your plant, then you don't have to follow all those rules, right? Um, and so that's when we're going to get into that point number six is understanding about NH2 nitrogen and how that's used by the plant. And then we're, you know, we need to realize that there are inorganic elements, cations and anions, micronutrients, major nutrients right, that don't have carbon. But if you're with, with the NOP, then you need to follow their rules on what kind of those elements you use. If you're not certified with NOP, then it's much less important. Go to the next. 
Okay, this again, I just wanted to put this in because it kind of summarizes the things that I uh, was talking about uh, on the previous uh, slide. So let's go to the next. All right, nitrogen is the only element that produces growth. If you don't have some form of nitrogen and you can have all you want of everything else, the plant won't grow. And most of you, I think, will be familiar with the nitrogen cycle and you know how it goes from fixation to mineralization, nitrification, immobilization, right? And that's okay, but most of those charts don't really understand the NH2. So let's go in to understanding this whole nitrogen picture more. Next. Okay, this is the first part of a leaflet that I produced that I think John has sent out to everybody. And I would urge you to read it carefully and uh, look at it. If you have any questions, get back to me. But basically, this first part says, plants can only use mineralized nitrogen. That's ammonium and nitrate. And this is research done by the University of California that takes different organic materials, and this was done in a lab so they could control the temperatures, and they could measure how much, what percentage of that material mineralized into, I think, it, mainly nitrate nitrogen after so many weeks. And so you can see there is some difference. For example, poultry manure is quite slow, but you can also see how temperature affects it. If there's more temperature, and I'm sure there was plenty of water in this uh, experiment, and so the microbes were able to mineralize that nitrogen. And so if you really look at this, I don't get very, you know, I, I, I think you can look at it too closely. When you start thinking that the plant knows there's a difference between 60% or 54% that's mineralized in eight weeks, uh, the scientists may know that, but I don't think that's that critical for a plant most of the time. Now, the bottom paragraph says there's new research. And if you go to that form, that, that leaflet that John sent out, I believe he sent it out, you can read some of the things that I put in, uh, you know, this was, some years ago, and so you can find new now, new information now. Um, but um, the I began back in the 1980s when I was living in Europe, and I was working throughout Europe and Africa and the Middle East, and some in Asia. Um, people were beginning to use amino acids. And at that time, there wasn't a lot of control, so you never knew exactly what you were getting. And the, um, but most of the time when I saw these amino acids used, I saw drastically different forms of growth. And so I got very interested. What is it about the amino acids that are causing different, different uh, kinds of growth? And let's go to the next. Now, this is one of the 
items that is mentioned on the next page uh, of that leaflet. And so this was back in the early 1980s when I was looking for some kind of information about what was causing this different growth. And I found this research and I've underlined what I think is the important part. The content of protein in the seed correlated with subsequent growth and yield. Now what happens with the stress of germination, the plant will, it will reduce that protein to NH2 nitrogen. And that will make immediate growth in the roots. And if the plant has a stronger root system, it's going to grow better throughout its life as long as that root system stays, stays strong. So when, when I saw this, the light bulb went on in my head and I said, why on earth haven't we realized before that there's some form of nitrogen that the plant can use that's not mineralized nitrogen? And it has to be a form because when the seed germinates, it, in order to metabolize mineralized nitrogen, ammonium and nitrate, it needs to go to the leaves to be reduced to NH2. And so this really began my research and, you know, my, you know, I'm not a researcher, it was always practical uh, consulting with farmers and different distributors in, in different countries. But when I understood this, I began to see how we could really change how a plant can grow. Go to the next. Okay. Now, if you want to, if you're not an organic grower, a certified grower, you can get some less expensive uh, forms of organic protein that will give you this NH2 nitrogen. You can go, <coughs> like there's a lot of animal feed that is not uh, certified for GMO, but you can get things like, like uh, soybean meal and things like that, that that are very effective and you can use those as fertilizers. Now, the other thing that I began to find was that urea, you know, remember for the, for the uh, chemist, urea is organic because it's got, it's got carbon. And in that leaflet, you'll see this, this portion at the bottom where Cornell University says the plant can take up ammonium, it can take up nitrate, and it can also take up urea, that's NH2-2CO, which has no charge. Now, at a, on a practical level, because urea, as soon as it gets wet in the presence of urease, and that seems to be every place, right, it converts very quickly to ammonium nitrogen. And so the window to catch that NH2 in urea is very short. Now there are ways to kind of hold that window um, and give the plant more of an opportunity to get that NH2 that comes from urea. Go to next. Next, next slide. Back one. There. Now, this is a slide that I developed 
and put together, oh, 15 or more years ago, 20 years ago, maybe more than 20 years ago, um, to try in my meetings with growers and with distributors to tell them how we needed to rethink nitrogen. Now, nitrogen, we have to think about it in two places, how it works in the soil and how it works in the plant. Now, how it works in the soil is the top part. And we understand that, that, that there's a lot of science about that, how the organic matter converts to ammonium or the urea converts to ammonium, and then the ammonium will convert to nitrate. Now in the plant, that's where we have not had complete information. And basically, I think about in the plant, nitrogen is sort of on the assembly line within the plant to produce protein and carbohydrates. So if we start on the left, nitrate is probably the easiest form of nitrogen to take up. It's got advantages and it's got disadvantages. I mentioned already, you get too much of it, you get excessive growth and the plant is weak and you can get diseases and everything, but it's necessary. But in our fertilizing practices, we tend to overfeed nitrate nitrogen. The plant reduces that nitrate to ammonium. And there are advantages and disadvantages of ammonium. It can be toxic. And it be, well, I think one of the reasons it is toxic, toxic is because it's a cation. And it competes with other cations. It will limit the uptake of other cations. And, um, and so if you're using a lot of ammonium fertilizer, right, and it's staying ammonium in the soil, then you want to make sure you're putting in more cations. And that's, that's major cations as well as uh, micronutrients. Well, once it's in the ammonium form, the plant breaks it down into the NH2 forms, the amides and the amides. And this is the part of nitrogen that we haven't understood. They're the precursors of protein. Now, if you look at that chart at the bottom, start on the right side with protein, and you see how the protein will break down in exactly the opposite way going to the left. Now, the, the, it's going to break down to the amino acids, it'll eventually get to ammonium, and then the soil is going to take over and <coughs> and turn it into nitrate. Let's go to the next. Now let me emphasize that the plant needs all three forms. They all go back to that previous chart or go back and look at it and, <coughs> and you'll see what's good and what's bad about each form, right? Um, it's, pretty rare for a plant to have too much organic nitrogen. I've seen a couple cases where we were using the stabilized urea that would stay in the organic farm. And because the farmers liked what they saw with a little bit, they put that on as the only form of nitrogen. And the plants didn't grow. They were stunted and they didn't really produce. So you need to understand and you need to watch the plant to see that these three forms of nitrogen are, um, are, are in balance the way the plant needs it. Go to the next. But plants are, are very similar in the way they take up, translocate, and utilize nutrients. But their abilities and their requirements and their preferences 
especially for the, for the ammonium and the nitrate forms, are very different. You, you know, a lot of the plants, and I think some of them that you're trying to grow as in rare fruit growers, uh, do best in an acid soil. They prefer ammonium nitrogen because acid soils slow down the conversion from ammonium to nitrate, right? But remember what I just said, because if you've got a good load of ammonium in the soil, you need to think about those other cations and especially calcium uh, that you probably need. Now you also have plants that are greedy, I guess you might call it, and they take up excessive amounts of nitrate, nitrogen. And so you get a lot of vegetative growth. Often it's at the reduced fruiting and flowering and quality is, is down, more disease, more pest pressure. And all of this is, <clears throat> is because of high nitrate. Now there's not a whole lot you can do if your soil has a lot of nitrate. It, it may leach if you have a leachy soil. Um, but what you want to do is if, you, you, if you've got a soil that, that is holding too much nitrate nitrogen and the plants are growing excessively uh, vegetatively, then you might think about applying on a regular basis small amounts of calcium chloride. The chloride competes with the nitrate. For example, I've had excellent success doing this in some countries where they're growing strawberries, um, where the soils held a lot of nitrate nitrogen. It didn't leach out. And what they grew were big strawberries, almost the size of apples, but you'd pick one and it began to go soft just immediately. And by doing the calcium nitrate a little bit, you know, every few weeks, that reduced the uptake of nitrate and the calcium improved the quality of the strawberries. And that same philosophy or that same approach could could work with any crop where you're seeing those negative effects of too much nitrate. Go to the next. Okay, now this is just the chart, and you can find these a lot of places that show the what normally is the concentration in dry matter of plants. And what you can see is what's in red there. Typical, you know, to give that dry matter what it has, the fertilizer would have to be about a 1.5, 0.2, 1.0, and a 0 0.5 calcium. Now notice that calcium is two and a half times more than phosphate, and it's 50% more than potassium. So my question, I, feel, I talk with a lot of people that their favorite fertilizer is the triple 20 or a triple 15. And I think, I just tell them, I say, let's, let's back off and think about what the plant really needs. Okay, go, go to the next slide. And this is kind of the similar chart just from another university, but it shows on the right side, the range. And so that's where you get in to some plants will take up a lot and others will take up less. You know, they have less ability. Uh, one of my favorite examples that I see on a lot of uh, uh, farms, of citrus farms, is to compare a lemon tree with a tangerine tree. Your lemon tree is what I call a good mother. It will produce fruit and hold fruit with a limited number of leaves. Most varieties of, trans, tra, of tangerines 
love to take up too, too much nitrate nitrogen. And so you get abundant leaf growth and it will usually reduce the production of the tangerines either in size or in quality or in both. You may get a lot of June drop because it won't have the cations it needs to, to be held. So when I'm, when I'm in a third world country talking with some pretty, uh, you know, very good farmers, but not, not highly educated, you know, with school learning, I say, <coughs> you gotta look at the plant to see if it's a good mother and takes care of the babies, or is it a bad mother that instead of taking care of its babies goes to the beauty parlor all the time and you get all this abundant growth of leaves that don't really that don't really help the fruit go to the next now this is a a, a, a plot trial or a, a tray trial that i show to a lot of researchers and I tell them, I say, now you're telling me plants cannot use anything except ammonium and nitrate nitrogen. So the plant on the left in, in the growing medium was put only ammonium nitrate. The plant in the middle simply had a finished good quality finished compost. So it was releasing a lot of this NH2 form of nitrogen. And look at the difference in the root system between the one on the left and the one in the middle. Now the one in the right had the good compost plus an organic protein. And this could be the stabilized urea, or it could be a protein that's really reduce or releasing that NH2. And so the root system is even much, much greater. And with that better root system, look at the difference of the top growth. And we're gonna see more and more examples. If you look at the roots and the top growth, you can better understand how the plant balances the different forms of nitrogen and the and and of course it needs all of the cations and everything else too. Okay, go to the next one. Okay, this this was a trial I did at a date farm <clears throat> in um, near Indio, and they were conventional. And so I said, you just keep applying your conventional fertilizer the way you always do it. We're not going to change the thing of that. And in addition to that, I want you to apply about once every three or four weeks um, a small amount of this urea that has been stabilized so it doesn't convert to ammonium. And you can see on the right, the if you can look down there at the cleaner whiter roots and how they have hair roots there that's because of the nh2 and it's also because we included some calcium chloride so that would be a highly soluble calcium in the soil solution and so those hair roots are viable when you look at the roots on the left, they does it, the, you can see the roots are dark. They don't have enough calcium to be strong. They've lost control of their exudates. Let's go to the next. This is citrus from the Central Valley. And um, this is using an 18007 that's made from urea and calcium chloride. It was a conventional farm. Again, I said, don't change what you're doing conventionally, but let's put in maybe every three or four weeks a small amount 
of this urea with stabilized urea with calcium. And this was taken about, about a month after they made the first application. Go to the next one. Now this, this one had a different analysis of urea with calcium. Because the, the grower had a lot of salinity problems, I said, well, let's try something that maybe has less NH2, but more calcium. And, and the roots are somewhat better, but in his case, that NH2 was giving even a better result uh, when we gave more NH2. Let's go to the next. Okay, this is a trial that I did here in Arizona on pistachios. And it was a conventional grower. And I wanted to show him how we could increase root growth over the winter when the trees are dormant. So I had him apply an organic plant protein, and it was based on soy, uh, in December. And in Dece and in after December, there were some very heavy winter rains. And when I went back to see the grower in, in, uh, in uh, February, he didn't even want to go look at, at, the, uh, at, at the plants. Because he said, look, if it's nitrogen, it's all been washed out. Because he was thinking nitrogen was conventional nitrate nitrogen, which does leach. NH2 doesn't leach. It's, we go back to that earlier uh, Cornell research. It doesn't have a charge. Um, so I wanted to show him. So by begging him, we got out to the to the uh, orchard and go to the next slide. And in all of my pictures, I should say, it's the farmer that picks the samples. I tell them, he treated several trees. I said, you just pick one. Now, over winter is when the tree normally moves its reserves down into the root system because the DNA of the plant that goes dormant is it wants to build a root system that's strong so that when spring comes, it's going to be able to grow productively. Well, here you can see from that December application of the soy until February, these were one-year-old trees, and you can see the greater root system that is there. Go to the next. Now, these were older trees, three-year-old trees. And there's still some difference, but not as much. Now, what was lacking, I think, in this trial to really give more of a dis uh, difference in the root growth over dormancy was additional calcium. Because since he was a conventional grower, he was applying a lot of phosphate and phosphate locks up calcium. I think if we had put more calcium in, within this soil, um, that we would have seen an even greater difference. As it was, it was better. The previous slide of the one-year-old trees had a bigger difference because the one-year-old tree still had reserves of calcium, right? It, and um, it was more, it, it hadn't been fertilized for three years with high levels of, of phosphate. Okay, go to the next one. Uh, Okay, these were some grapes, again in Arizona. And again, a conventional grower. I used, because he was conventional, I used the urea 
uh, with calcium in the NH2 and go to the next one. And here you can see we're beginning to see more branching of the roots of the, uh, the treated roots. While on the left side, the control, very little branching. And remember, roots take up nutrients from the growing tips. If you have roots that look like long spaghettis and they don't have branching, they're not, it's not an efficient root system, right? The other thing that is really good about all those hair roots is uh, that that's the main source of production of cytokine. And remember back in that GMO research, cytokine reduces senescence. Okay, go to the next. Now, this is a picture I just took of a typical orchard fertilized with a lot of nitrate nitrogen. And I tell growers, if you can look out in your grove and you see all of these branches reaching for the sky, it looks like a bunch of Sioux Indians with feathers in their headdress, right in their hair, right? That growth is not productive at all. In fact, it's, it's actually weakening, it's weakening the woody tissue below. So people will prune it off to try to stop it, but it's already taking what the reserves are in the wood that the wood and the branches need in order to produce whatever the, the fruit is that we're trying to grow. Okay, let's go to the next. Now let's talk about solubility. And I'm going to talk about mainly the major cations, also micronutrients, but the biggest problem I tend to see is in the major cations. Go to the next. When I talk with people, most people talk to me about the chart that's on the left, about how the pH affects the availability of different nutrients. Now this may be okay in, this, in a laboratory, right? But when you're in the soil, in the real soil of a farm, there's a war going on and all of those nutrients either are antagonistic or synergistic with other nutrients. And this is much more important than just your pH, thinking that if you keep a pH, you're going to get, you know, the, the, the right amount. The, <clears throat> the, uh, it certainly, pHs, pH does affect the availability in the soil solution. But when you have a perfect pH for a particular nutrient, if you've got too much of something else, then that, well, let's take the case of calcium and, and phosphorus, because that's we see all the time. Uh, if you have too much phosphorus, it locks up the calcium in the soil. It forms calcium phosphate, which is not very soluble. And um, so, so you want to keep that in mind. Go to the next. Okay, this is a very good, this is from another one of my presentations where I go in the, this in more detail uh, about how the cations are important in a fertility program. And, and this is a very good, you could probably get this research uh, on the internet. And if, if you can't find it, I've got it in another presentation and I'd be glad to send it to you. Um, the, this this uh, uh, researcher, this doctor, 
uh, is, is really a good one. He has said some of the best things that I've read about cations. And I've had the opportunity to meet him a few times and, and I admire his, uh, his work and his open mind. Go to the next. Okay, these, these are soil tests and soil solution tests of somebody that I was working with in Mexico in very saline conditions. And you can see, let, I'll, I'll tell you, when you look at a soil test, that's what you would normally get. It would tell you, if you look at the bar chart on the right, that you have tons of calcium. It's saying you've got, if I can read this in this little screen, 86% uh, uh, percent calcium, and the ideal is to have 68 to 72. So it looks like you got lots of calcium. On the right, look at the blue chart. That's the soil test. It says, yeah, you've got too much sodium, but it's still nah, only maybe double what it should be, right? Well, when you do a soil solution test, you look and see what the plant is going to find with its roots when it goes into that soil and it will find the solubilized nutrients. Now look at the, at the red bars. Almost no calcium is available because it's just not available. Whereas sodium is through the roof, right? Go to the next slide. Here you have bigger uh, bigger vision of what was a couple little boxes at the bottom. And so you can see the soil solution said, your percent of the soil solution, 92% was sodium and only 4% was calcium. Whereas that, that the soil test said you had 88% calcium. This is why a lot of people think, Oh, I don't need calcium. Uh, my soil has a lot of it. Uh, and it just doesn't tend to work that way. Go to the next. This was another trial that I did with the grower. And you can see, you can go back and you can look at it. The, the, he had a different soil entirely, but you can see that there was twice, um, almost twice as much sodium in the soil solution of, uh, than there was in the soil analysis. Whereas when you look at calcium, it just had about 5%, 4.5% of what the soil test showed. And you can see the similar kind of ratios because this is what this shows what I call the hierarchy. Sodium is very soluble and it's going to take over the soil solution. Potassium is the next most soluble cation. And so you get pretty good you know, uptake, uh, pretty good uh, uh, potassium availability. Magnesium is a little less soil uh, soluble. So you've only got about 10% in the soil solution of what the soil test shows you. Whereas calcium has about 5%. And so keep in mind this, this, uh, soil solution in the in in versus the soil test now 
one of the things that I have seen very commonly in California is people will show me their tissue analysis. And according to the tissue analysis, everything looks to be great. Yet they have fruit drop or the very uh, poor quality of the fruit. Uh, it may not have good shelf life. And so I ask those people, well, have you ever done a soil test? And they say, no, you know, they tell us, my advisor says the, the, the leaf analysis is gonna be the best. I said, we'll do a soil test and get a soil analysis and get a soil solution analysis. And what I've seen in every one of those instances is phosphate has a line that goes off the chart it has locked up all of that calcium. It's very possible what was going on with this particular one, this particular sample. Okay, let's go to the next. Now we'll talk about mobility and we'll get back to that source in sink and we'll talk about the xylem and the phloem. Go to the next. Okay, the phloem is what typically takes the reserves from the leaves, the production, the photosynthesis, the sugar in the leaves, or the extra amounts of, of minerals that are stored in the leaves, and it will move them down in the plant or up into the plant, up into new growth, right? Um, so that the phloem really holds the key to how the plant is putting the nutrients, the hormones, and the energy into the areas where we want it to be. Now, the inorganic cations and anions are very important. And I've mentioned here specifically, calcium and boron have very low mobility in the phloem. So you can have a lot of calcium and boron in your older leaves, and you won't have enough where the plant is trying to make buds and fruit. Go ahead to the next one. Now, this, this shows <clears throat> what the plant, and this, this is from some research and we don't know what, what the soil is like or anything, but it shows us some interesting things. It's showing us in the xylem tissue, what's coming up from the soil. Then it's showing what's in the phloem tissue. And you can see what I talked about sodium. There's two and a half times more sodium that's moving to the growing parts of the plant than is coming up from the soil. Potassium, we're also seeing a lot in the xylem because potassium is very important to move things in the phloem. And plants need a lot of potassium. And I'm sure you all know the physical uh, signs of a potassium problem in that if your new leaves are green and your older leaves are going brown around the edge, those older leaves are taking potassium out of the reserves in the older leaves and moving it to the new. Magnesium, again, more is being moved than because it does translocate in the plant. You've got three times more in the phloem than you had coming up in the xylem. But look at calcium. You've got less than half of the calcium that's coming up that's moving out in the phloem. Now let's look down at nitrogen. You've got coming up from the soil, the plant is taking up 
some amino compounds. These would, this would be the amino acids and the NH2 nitrogen. But because, and for some reason, the researcher didn't do anything with nitrate. They only showed ammonium. But the plant gets the nitrate and the ammonium in the leaves, and it produces the amino compounds. And that's why in the phloem, that's the energy that's going to all the different parts of the plant where the, where the plant wants to, to send that energy for growth. Okay, go to the next one. This is a bigger picture of that last study, and I've included th that just so you can look and see some of the other trace elements. Like here, uh, you know, even iron, which, which we all learn is not very mobile. There's more in the phloem than there is in the xylem, right? And so most of the trace elements will move pretty well in the phloem. It doesn't mean they don't need more. And that's where foliar application of some of those trace elements can, can help. But look at phosphorus. The wonderful thing about phosphorus is it is extremely mobile. You don't need huge amounts of phosphorus. I don't know that I have ever seen a real phosphorus deficiency. The people have the idea that phosphorus makes growth, makes roots, but it doesn't. It's all about cell division and DNA and things like that, and you need some, uh, but when you over apply the phosphorus, that's when you start having severe problems with calcium. Okay, go to the next one. Okay, so here it's just kind of a review. What's high mobile, uh, highly mobile, medium mobility, and low mobility? And, and that's why I call it is the plant's handicap. I have had more success in improving quality and production with regular applications of calcium and boron. Not real high amounts, but it has to be done repeatedly. In a fast growing plant, like if you're growing tomatoes and, and the weather's right and it's growing gangbusters, you probably want to apply this at least every week, you know, in a weak solution, and you want to wet the whole plant because it will penetrate not only the leaves, it will penetrate the woody tissue. Even on trees, we can make uh, of applications of boron and calcium <clears throat> in, in the winter, and we will see a difference in the fruiting in the spring, the flowering in the spring. Go to the next one. Okay, now this you'll have to look at carefully, but, but this was done with an organic grower up in Oregon that was in very heavy organic soil. He, those, that soil was loaded with nitrates. And he was growing tomatoes and he was growing cucumbers and his <clears throat> tomatoes were getting blossom end rot and his cucumbers were twisting and curling rather than being nice and long and straight. And I said, okay, we'll start spraying calcium and boron. And he didn't believe me. He said, no, this is about a trace element. Maybe I need more iron or copper or something. So I, I said, all right, I want you to go through these plants. <laughs> and from the top third and the bottom third, kind of in the middle of those areas, pick leaves and get them analyzed separately. So we can see <coughs> what's being stored in the lower leaves and what is in the upper leaves. So the top and bottom refers to the upper leaves and the lower leaves. And what you can see is nitrate is very, very mobile. 
you know, there's, there's, there's more on top than in the bottom. Phosphate, again, it's very mobile, right? It, it's got all it needs. It's, it's about one to one. Potassium, you know, his soil didn't have any deficiencies. It's about one to one. Magnesium is a little less mobile. So your ratios are about one to 1 1.6 or one to two. Let's skip calcium and boron and look at what he thought the problems were. Zinc, copper, and iron. And you'll see there was mobility of those, of those elements. But look at calcium and boron. You can see that this top one, there was over three and a half times more calcium in the lower leaves than the top leaves. And that was what was affecting his fruit. The, the, the second one of calcium, it's three to one. The cucumbers, 2.7 to one. And then look at boron. Boron from two to three more times boron in the bottom leaves and the top leaves. And plants need calcium and boron to make strong cell structure. So when he started spraying regularly, his problems went away. Okay, let's go to the next. They, this was a trial of <clears throat> organic um, trees up in, uh, oh, where was it? Up, up, up in Northern California someplace. He was conventional and he was spraying four times zinc, iron, manganese, and kelp, which is hormones. The leaves from his treatment were the leaves on the left. I had him spray four sprays of calcium and boron and look at the difference in the size and the quality of those leaves. And, and he was very confident that that gave him a lot of advantages. He had more photosynthate production. He had <clears throat> um, stronger, stronger new growth, and he was going to get better nuts. Go to the next one. This was olives, and this, this was up, up in the hills in the, um, in, outside of Fresno, up in the, the hills of the mountains. They were conventional. And I said, okay, what I want you to do, and they weren't spraying anything. So I said, okay, before flowering starts, make a spray of calcium and boron. These were typical leaves from the treated and, and the untreated trees. And you can see the difference in the strength of the leaves, of the flowers, and go to the next one. Here you have a close-up of the flowers. And you see how, where we sprayed calcium and boron, how much stronger the flowers were. And if you look at the control, you see in these flowers what I would call inner node length, right? Um, where, we, where there was more calcium and boron, the flowers were able to produce along the stem much in a much more dense pattern and a much stronger pattern. And of course, he got a better yield. Go ahead to the next one. Okay, this was some work I did in, in Mexico, and it was conventional zucchinis. 
I had the guy make four applications of calcium and boron and to continue his other program the way he always did it. I got there the day or two days after they made all the harvest, but the grower said he had 17% more marketable yield and where they were sprayed, there was no mildew. And <clears throat> So I said, well, you still got the plants here. Go break off the branches and let's look at them. And you can see on the right, the branches and the leaves, the, the, the stems are strong and straight. The leaves are laying out flat. Whereas when there was insufficient calcium and boron, the branches, the stems and the leaves were doing just like the, like, like the zucchinis, you know? The, they weren't the shape that genetically they wanted to be. Go ahead to the next one. This was a strawberry grower also in Mexico, conventional. So <clears throat> I said, all right, we'll put through some of this NH2 in your drip a little bit. I said, keep doing everything you're doing. I don't want to change anything because if we start changing your program, <clears throat> you know, we're not going to really see what I'm recommending is going to do. So I said, you know, every three or four weeks, put through <clears throat> some of in a liquid form through the drip irrigation, some of this NH2 nitrogen. And I said, in addition, every week or 10 days, as often as you can justify it, once we'll start before flowering because, because that calcium and boron will go into the crown and make the crown stronger. And, and I said, and let's see you know, what happens. Now I wasn't able to go back and the grower sent me these photographs. And he told me, he said, I was harvesting from both sides beautiful strawberries, but I put a box of the control and the treated in my office. And after about a week, I saw the shelf life problem that my, that my normal program was having. You know, and he was in Mexico. And Mexican growers have a big problem with shelf life. By the time it gets to the United States, gets to the supermarket, a lot of the produce is going bad. And so <clears throat> calcium and boron really, really saved him a lot of lost shipments to the United States. Go to the next one. Now, this is kind of a, I call it a water test deficiency. If you, if you have some plants you're treating with the NH2 and maybe including some boron and calcium, and if you're organic, you know, you're getting some silicone in there. From your control and your treated, get two leaves at the same position on, on the stems, and pull them off at exactly the same time and watch how quickly they wilt. Well, what you can see right off the bat is the wilting, but look how much thicker and stronger the stem is where he was applying the NH2 and the calcium and the boron. And so that plant was holding, um, holding its moisture better. Okay, now I just see John Rogers. Can I get back? I've only got a few more pages. Okay, hang on. Are we are we back? I see. I see. I Can think it's Craig. Okay? Craig's picture with the mask. Yeah. Don't you see everybody else? The screen changed, but it's still working. Okay, hang on. I just want to make sure everybody's back here because it uh, it blinked out for a second. So, okay, it looks like we're good. Let me go ahead and uh, catch us back up here. Uh, am I still in charge? No, John, you're in charge again. 
You want to flip back real quick? Yeah. Oh. I'm here. Okay, Ron, thank you. Okay. You should have it. Yeah, we got it again. So okay. uh, I think we got 20, 28 people here. So I want to make sure we, we kind of got everybody back. All right, good. Let me go ahead and do a shared screen again. And it looks like we're still recording. So uh, go ahead, Jim. You're okay. Up. All right. Go, go on to the next one. I think this is something okay. that you can do with a lot of crops. I've done it with tomato plants and all sorts of things. Okay. <clears throat> now, here's, again, some highlights <clears throat> about the calcium problems in the plant's um, uh, handicap. And, and one of the things, if you look at the bottom of this list, the, 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 the two things, the two final things, more calcium inhibits or it slows down senescence. And calcium is recognized as what they call the second messenger. It's, it's almost like a hormone. It's what allows plants to signal from one cell to another. <clears throat> and so when the plant has ethylene, it will move calcium a short distance. It doesn't go a long way. And so if you've got a tree that <clears throat> has too much ethylene, I'm sure you're all familiar with what they call witch's broom at the end. Rather than having good growth, you get all of these, these shoots that look just like a, a, a broom. And that's a real, real problem. And it, it shows you that you need more calcium and boron, and you may have too much nitrate. Go to the next one. <clears throat> now you can do a lot of research <clears throat> and look at how traditional soil science has failed to understand the importance of calcium. Most most reports, most agronomists say, calcium, don't worry about it. You've got plenty in the soil. Well, that's probably all right when you don't use much nitrogen, but we're all pushing with nitrogen because we want more growth. So you can do some research, and this is just a page from one of the research pages that I pulled out. Go to the next. Now, a lot of people are afraid of boron. And with some reason, too much is toxic. But <clears throat> what boron, boron, you could almost think of it, if calcium is a brick, boron is like cement. It helps form strong cell structure. Now, hormonally, Boron has a very important effect and that it reduces oxen hormones. Now you remember oxins are the hormones that make apical growth dominance. If you put too much boron on a, on a plant, you'll kill it because it stops that growth, right? <clears throat> but a little bit of boron can slow down that excessive growth. And I've worked in a lot of <clears throat> high temperature uh, growing situations, you know, high where at like say the winter tomatoes in Mexico or in some places in the Middle East, right? Normally, at, as, as spring is coming and summer is approaching, the production goes down, the plants begin to die. But I've had a few cases where growers have told me, hey, we want to extend life because like a, a tomato producer in Mexico might say they had a freeze in Florida and I can get <coughs> more for tomatoes now than any time during the season, but this is when normally 
I can hardly sell them. Well, I've worked with them and we've applied boron and we have extended the production of quality tomatoes three or four weeks by slowing down that excessive vegetative growth and also putting in calcium to reduce the stress of the higher temperatures. Let's go to the next. Now I've already talked about phosphate and calcium and I, and I can't overemphasize. It's one of the most common problems I see. And let's go to the next picture. This shows something. This was a greenhouse grower and he, um, he was fertilizing with different rates of phosphate and potassium. Now they were all, he was using all organic proteins. <clears throat> and so he was getting good growth. But you can see here on the left, the, the, the fertilizer applied was a 712. On the right was a 757, and the one in the middle was kind of in the middle. You can see the more phosphate and potassium we put in is reducing the calcium availability. So our root structure was not as good and the plant growth was not as good. So go to the next slide. You have a poor root system on the right <clears throat> and you get poor top growth. You have a good root system on the left and you have good top growth. A lot, <clears throat> a lot of times growers are always amazed that I, I wanna look at the roots of the good plants and the bad plants because they both tell a very important story. Go to the next. Okay, there's a problem in California that most of the people, when I mention chloride, they shake in their boots. Well, chloride, you know, chloride is an anion. It's not toxic. It's an essential nutrient, right? Now, the chlorine gas, that is a toxic one. The problem with chloride <clears throat> is it competes with nitrate, like I mentioned before. So if you're limited with nitrate and the plant is, is limiting that uptake of nitrate because of the chloride, it's really a lack of nitrate that's a problem, <clears throat> not the excessive chloride. Now, sodium is feared and with very good re reason. And <clears throat> while a lot of people think they can leach sodium, it's a hard one to leach unless you have very sandy soil and very clean sodium-free water. And right now, a lot of people are getting Colorado River water, and you know that's full of sodium, right? <clears throat> and so the best way to handle if you have sodium is to put in more calcium. You'll have to overpower it. You'll have to get the law of mass action. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay. Hormones, that's the stress. Go to the next one. These are all the things that, have, that stress a plant that reduce its genetic potential. Go ahead to the next one. So <clears throat> since, remember I said, any stress produces ethylene and this can be good or bad. Tree plants, you know, like stone fruit and apples and things, they need cold winters for that stress to convert the stored protein into amine nitrogen for bud growth. And if you don't have, you know, I've, I've worked in countries like Egypt and Saudi Arabia, Arabia with uh, fruit trees, 
and <coughs> the um, <coughs> excuse me, they would apply <coughs> an ethylene type of a compound to try to substitute uh, for the um, for the ethylene that the tree could not break down or could not produce normally. Now, ethylene is bad when it breaks down cell structure. That's why when you're stressed later in the season, you get fruit drop and your plants don't store well and you get more diseases. Okay, go ahead. Okay, again, you can do research and you can look for a lot of these things about the, the role of calcium in stress resistance. And again, remember what I said earlier, <clears throat> you're going to see some research that contradicts other research, but you just got to kind of wade through it and then watch the plant and see what, what works. Go ahead to the next. Okay, here's what to do if you've got too much ethylene at the wrong times. Put the NH2 and soluble calcium in the soil solution. The cytokines are produced in the root hairs and they help resist the senescence from ethylene. Go back to that GMO researcher. Foliar apply calcium and boron to the fruit, little and often and you're going to get longer shelf life. And, you know, remember, apple growers know this. They will, they, they don't know how to apply it. They may not apply it to the growing apple tree, but when they harvest apples, they wash the apples in a calcium chloride solution. That, cell, that calcium <clears throat> goes into the apple tissue and slows down senescence. Now, I did work earlier, somebody was talking about bananas. Uh, I did work with bananas in the Middle East and in the Canary Islands and in Spain. And <clears throat> we, they were having problems that the bananas curled too much, almost like a cucumber, so that they were actually rubbing against one another and that rubbing, you know, as you know, with bananas, any, any damage creates ethylene. So the quality of the bananas was poor. So we sprayed calcium and boron uh, from the earliest time the bunch began to appear, the flower began to appear. And we straightened out those bananas so they looked more like normal, normal uh, bananas, right? And if Excess nitrate is your problem. Go back and think about small amounts of boron to see if you can rein in that excessive applicable, applicable, applicable growth dominance. Now, it almost makes the plant react <clears throat> like cold weather. So if you try to spray boron when the temperature's cold, you'll probably kill the plants. Go to the next. Okay, so here's the, the, the summary. You know, I've gone on an awful long time. I hope I haven't bored you too much. Uh, you can read this. John said he's, he's uh, recorded it. Some, I did see a message pop up saying the slides were going too fast, but you know, I probably made a mistake and tried to cover too much stuff, but I wanted to open up some thoughts that maybe you weren't having. Okay, <clears throat> go to the next. So, this again summarizes, this is from some other presentations I did, on what to do when you see your plant isn't producing and isn't growing the way that you think its DNA really want it to, right? And so you can review those and, and, uh, and come to me with any questions. So go ahead. <clears throat> so I really wanna thank you for the opportunity. I wanna apologize 
for if it's been too long for you, but I think I kind of wanted to cover as much as I could because I thought we'd have opportunity to discuss it more. Now I'm going to be leaving on a three week vacation. So you're welcome to email me, but I may not get back to you before I, I return sometime in the middle of, uh, of, uh, of October. And I know there were some questions that were popping up. Um, I think I probably, you know, and, and <laughs> I've always said the head only observes, uh, the head only absorbs as much as the rear end can stand. And I have a hunch I've probably overdone that. But I hope you found something interesting. Anything you don't agree with, come to me, because maybe I skipped over it too quickly. Uh, I love to discuss these things, and so I look forward to hearing from you. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Jim. Boy, that was great. Uh, I never learned so much, and I don't know, about plants. So yeah, it's wonderful. You Really enjoyed it. Um, you know, we we the uh, we may have lost when this when this blipped. We may have lost the previous um, questions because I don't see anything right now. Yeah, yeah, the chat is on. Yeah. Um, anyway, if if somebody has any questions, we can now open this up. Let me. Um, I think and I, I can uh, unmute all. There, I've unmuted everybody. If anybody has any questions, uh, well, I see one here. I, I see one here from Ron. It says, "I wonder how most of this basic plant metabolic me, me, metabolic function relates specifically to exotic plants." Well, exotic plants are plants that you're bringing from a different kind of environment and trying to grow them in your environment. And everything that I've talked about is about how to reduce those stresses. Probably one of the biggest things you can do, if you have a plant that comes from an acidic soil and you've got a high pH soil, you can use more ammonium nitrogen and you are more um, uh, NH2 if you have that, <clears throat> but remember, you're going to have to put in more cations, and that's calcium and, and probably the micronutrients. Well, a lot of the stuff that I think that we're dealing with um, actually comes from, let's say, a, a limestone-based soil uh, with a lot of tannins going out from the uh, canopy, especially with the tropicals. So, you know, we have a kind of an interesting balance in our local climate. Um, to kind of, let's say, replicate or at least bridge over those needs. And so what I've been using is calcium bicarbonate um, in water uh, as well as in gypsum and then um, also just usually using a chemical fertilizer um, on top of, let's say, uh, decomposed like organic compost that I've made um, to kind of replicate that. And so, you know, so far, I've been okay, but uh, you know, we'll see. It's still young in the process. Ron, are you? I think uh, you're doing. Uh, you know, you're you're doing <clears throat> some of those calcium, like calcium bicarbonate. It's not the, all that soluble. Calcium sulfate <clears throat> is more soluble. Okay. <clears throat> but you might want to play a little bit with calcium chloride. But remember, it doesn't take much, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and you could try a little bit, mix them with with some urea, and uh, uh, try to make something like a five zero zero ten or an eighteen zero zero seven, like those citrus uh, roots, and you could do that both foliarly and. Um, and, and in the soil. And you know, these are the kind of things when I work with growers, you know, I'm looking at the plants and I am a big believer in 
listening to the plant, what it's trying to tell you by how it grows. And, um, and unfortunately, yeah, that's difficult to do over the internet. But uh, to me, it's very important. And a lot of people do a soil test or a tissue test and they say, well, this is what I need to do. And I said, well, how would you feel if you went to a doctor and he didn't ask you how you feel or what's wrong? He just sent you straight to the lab. Uh, and that's what I think a lot of growers do, relying too much on, on the test when the plant's growth is telling us an awful lot about what we should be doing. Are uh, most of your sprays, be, I mean, uh, most of your applications being done with foliar spray, sprays or are they uh, done in the water going into the ground? Okay, the, the, I think it's important to get the soil solution right, okay? Uh, because it all starts in the soil. Okay. Calcium and boron are two elements because of their, their immobility in the phloem, will, will uh, foliar ap application will help a lot, right? And again, a little bit frequently wetting, not just the leaves, but the woody tissue. In fact, working with trees, I think it's even more important to wet the branches and the stems and even the trunk than the leaves themselves. Um, and, <clears throat> and so that's foliar, right? If you have a pretty good mix of nutrients in the soil solution, you, you probably won't have a lot of problems with, with your other nutrients, you know? A lot of, People that see iron deficiency, for example, um, when, they, when it's yellow, uh, or they'll see potassium uh, deficiency around the edge of leaves, it, it's because the plant needs more than it's getting from the, the soil. Uh, but so, so you can help it both ways, but remember when you foliar apply, what you put in the leaf stays in the leaf when you're talking about trace elements, right? It's not gonna move very much in the flow. Go back, go back to that one sheet that showed the kind of difference between the xylem and phloem concentrations. For, for the home gardener, like myself is very novice. All my plants are desperately needing something. How would you make this foliar spray for calcium and boron? I know you said calcium chloride. I know you said boron, but at what ratios? And, and give me a starting point. Okay, I, I like to make it, if you're, if you're using calcium chloride, you know, either as a dry or a liquid, and you're probably using solubor for the boron. Very carefully weigh it all out because it's a weight weight type of a thing. And yeah. you need to have the, the weight of the water. That probably the ratio that I have found to be most useful is about a six parts of calcium to one part of boron. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, yeah, what concentration on that? Um, uh, six parts per million? Or that's well, just the ratio? Six, six percent, you know, six percent, weight, weight. And okay, so if I made a liquid that, and you could probably find some, what you want to stay away from is calcium nitrate because that nitrate will will aggravate the nitrate problem so so if you use solubor and calcium chloride <clears throat> and you make something that has a concentration of six parts and one part 
um, you know, 6% and 1% of your solution, calcium, 6, boron, 1. I would mix that to about maybe a 1.5% solution. If you had real severe problems, maybe a 2%. So, so you'd put, you know, I'm used to working on big farms, so you'd put maybe one or one and a half gallons and a hundred gallons of water, right? But you can make that cups or whatever you want. <laughs> and that's, you're talking about diluting the 6% calcium solution you make up. Yeah, I'm talking about, about the concentration of the solution you're going to foley or apply. Okay. So 1% would be too strong? Uh, how much? You said 1% or 1.5%? between you know all these things are relative right depending on what the problem is and and what else is going on uh i would say use at least one percent okay. to one and a half percent and if you're having a problem <clears throat> in that the new growth is not strong or you're having fruit drop or something um uh you know try one and a half to two percent now, what's important is you need to start early. You want to start before flowering, and you want to be wetting all of the stems and branches because that's going to penetrate the branch and get into the phloem and move out to the bud and the fruit. It's, I always tell people, I'm saying, you know, <clears throat> Solving calcium and boron problems, it, it's like a, a, a car insurance. You can't buy the insurance once you have the wreck, right? You need to, you need to build up that strength, right, from the beginning. Now, if, if it's too late and you already have the problem, go ahead and start applying it. You may reduce it some. <clears throat> but mainly learn from that experience and start with the next season or even in the dormant season. Okay. And it should be applied at least weekly for in the beginning if it's really bad? Should we apply it when? Uh, like weekly, monthly, quarterly? Okay. <clears throat> the faster the plant grows, the more frequent you should apply it. If you're Got it. growing <clears throat> tomatoes or cucumbers or peppers weekly, weekly to every 10 days is probably good. If you're looking at a tree crop, you probably would like, you probably should apply at least four times. And, and this is what I would typically recommend as a rule of thumb apply once the first application let's start after dormancy okay um apply it about three or four weeks before you expect uh shoot growth or bud break then probably another one just before it's going to flower. Then do another one. If, if you're talking about a tree where you tend to get what's commonly called June drop, then make a third application before that hot weather is going to give you a June drop, right? And, and then if, the, if that is working well, it wouldn't even hurt to do another one as soon as the plant enters dormancy, it will penetrate the woody tissue and it will complement uh, what you're going to do before bud, bud break. So on trees, you know, and again, talking with commercial growers, a lot of times they have uh, considerations, they can't do it as much, but I always tell them, do it at least three times and you may if you can do it as much as five, you'll probably get benefit. Any 
And you were okay. talking about, yeah, you were talking about plant protein. Um, normally, I just use like a blood meal for nitrogen. But should I mix it with the plant protein as a fertilizer? Well, <coughs> now, my experience and, and uh, uh, is plant protein seems to work better in a quicker root response. Um, <clears throat> I've got theories about that, but I've not found any real research because this is one area that if it's being researched, I haven't found it yet. But here's my theory. <clears throat> The microbes in the soil probably are more used to plant protein than animal protein. Maybe some of those microbes are vegetarian, I don't know, right? But <clears throat> decaying roots and, and organic matter, you know, plant matter in the soil is that's coming from a plant source seems to work better. And the, the best one that I have seen, and what I usually recommend, is <clears throat> uh, soy meal. And you don't need to put it in all the time. I would put it in, you know, uh, if, if it's a, if, you know, if it's if it's a crop you're transplanting or planting, put it in the soil, um, and uh, that would probably would carry you for the season, right? Um, and uh, so I like to apply the plant protein or the animal protein too early. <clears throat> I did I did several. Uh, research projects comparing <clears throat> feather meal to plant protein and the plant protein always seemed to to do better i I've, I've never really done it with blood blood <clears throat> blood meal is is so expensive that a lot of commercial growers don't use it so is fish meal yeah yeah, and, you know, I mean, fish meal and all those, 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 uh, you know, shell meals and everything, you know, uh, they're, they're good because <clears throat> they, they also give you calcium, but a lot of times, like fish meal will also bring a lot of sodium along with it. So <clears throat> I've usually tried to avoid, uh, going through drip irrigation with liquid fish. Okay. I have a question for you that's personal. What part of Arizona are you in? I am in Pierce, Arizona. Which Where is that? It's, it's, if you know Arizona a little bit, <clears throat> it's probably about 40, 45 miles from Bisbee, maybe 30 or the two most important elements in the seed are protein. And I talked about that because that's how it's going to go to the NH2 nitrogen and also calcium. Uh, seeds that are low in either or both of those things don't, don't germinate and produce the the strong growth like the others. And that's why when we see a field of crops, they're all individuals. And some of the plants are kind of stunted and some look great. And it's because those seeds are not all exactly the same, right? And, and so you can help it a little bit with some NH2 and, and some calcium in the soil. Good to know. Okay.